Hello, and welcome back to the lab. Today on the bench is something decidedly more modern than I normally take a look at here in the lab, but this is a time-sensitive project for another technician, and I need to get these finished up in the very, very near future. And as you can tell, probably from the audio, I am not sounding so great. Um, I've been laid up for the last three weeks ill and have not had a voice to record. This is the first time I've been able to record since before the Christmas holiday. So in this case, I had a technician reach out to me and ask me if I had some workstations that would be good learning workstations for Linux. And I happen to have one of these com computers sitting doing nothing. The other one was actually driving my entertainment center our TV that was a smart TV that quit updating and I needed something to uh, do smart TV functions on a very, very old TV. That also died, which is part of what happened to these guys. So uh, what we had the configuration for the entertainment center was we had a generic um, Core i7 computer. I think it was 16 gigs of RAM. And I had a GT1030 graphics card in here. I'll show that here in a little bit because I'll talk about what the replacement was. Um, didn't need much in terms of storage, so it had a 256 gig SSD. So what ended up happening is our TV kind of has been struggling for about eight, nine months, and it finally gave up. Now, struggling is, it was a power supply problem in the TV, uh, and it was an older Samsung TV. The um, TV was... 12 years old so it had a good run for being a uh, TV that was used fairly heavily uh, it was something in the 60 it was a 65 inch and it was um, uh, it, was, it wasn't even 4k it was it was 1080 so we decided to update the TV and this computer has sat there for three four ish years and has been fine, no problems. Everything's been running great, um, nothing to speak of, and everything's been pretty solid. What ended up happening is we upgraded to a 4K TV, so I asked the computer to then deliver 4K by 30 or 4K by 60 content if I could do it. Turned out the uh, GT1030 graphics card was capable of doing... Um, 4K by 60. So everything was going good. Looked like we were getting everything all tuned up. Uh, we had some receiver problems as well, but nothing uh, totally catastrophic. But given the way the audio was working, because it's a full surround sound setup, we had uh, we did end up at, uh, upgrading the receiver at the same time because I ran into some trouble with Windows and dealing with surround sound, and we will get into that, because that had some weird, bizarre bugs that were actually kind of odd and funny. So, in the beginning, I wasn't sure if that GT1030 was going to handle the uh, 4K graphics the way I wanted it to, and also deal with the surround sound correctly. So I had one of these that I could run as an experiment, and we got one of these guys, which is a Dell Precision 5820 workstation. So this is a uh, pretty powerful computer, has a um, the CPU and memory amount doesn't really matter in this case. The graphics card was what was important. To get the 4K out of the TV, I needed a display port or HDMI. I think the flavor is 2.1 if I remember correctly. So I wasn't sure that GT1030 was going to have the high speed enough HDMI port on it to drive the TV. So I initially went with this offering. Um, and this had a, well, I'll just pop the case. Uh, this has a Radeon Pro WX3200 graphics card in it. So... I have four display ports that were definitely fast enough to drive a 4K signal uh, and handle all the things that I was going to throw at it. Uh, this is a 2.5 gig NIC 
and that would have been nice to use as well. Um, part of what ended up with this, and if there's any interest, we ended up doing a back-end networking upgrade here at the facility, and lots of things changed. Lots of the back-end hardware that supports the lab, the bench, the channel, a lot of that got upgraded right around Thanksgiving. So we did some pretty cool stuff. Uh, did not turn the camera on for anything, uh, for any of that. So, But if there's interest, let me know, and I can do a video talking about some more of the back-end back end behind the scenes lab stuff. The graphics card in here is an ATI card. My personal opinion on ATI cards is I have struggled in the past with their drivers. Um, and every once in a while when I try to use them, I get weird quirks that just don't make sense. This is one of those quirks. So we get everything hooked up with this computer. Uh, I've got a fresh install of Windows on it. Nothing major. Uh, it came with a copy of Windows, so we used, uh, I think it was 10 uh, or 11. Maybe it was 11. I don't remember. Get all the drivers loaded. Get everything installed. Windows is fully updated. Everything's working. I've got video. I'm, I'm getting 4K 60, but I'm not getting HDR. Uh, but that ended up being a TV setting, not a computer problem. But I went to set up the audio with this. And what happened is the audio field in the room, if you can imagine this being the TV, the audio field in the room was rotated 90 degrees. So the center channel was coming out over here when it should have been coming out right here. And it was just bizarre. I spent hours troubleshooting it. I reinstalled the computer three times. Uh, a ton of troubleshooting. Everything was quasi working okay. I would get the channels. I'd install the AMD drivers and out to lunch. It, it just, it, the audio, I actually never got the audio to work correctly through the HDMI port. Um, it was uh, sourced directly into the TV eARC out of the TV into the receiver and we even tried it directly into the receiver and that was one of the troubleshooting steps we did was I thought it may have been the receiver not talking to the new TV correctly and so we ended up getting a full 4 and 8k receiver uh, Denon receiver and uh, still no change the audio was still messed up and not coming out in the correct positions for a 5.1 setup so after troubleshooting it for probably three or four hours, I gave up and I went back to my mini PC, which was this guy right here. So since the new workstation wasn't working for the uh, audio in the correct positions, which that's really hard to watch TV. To be perfectly honest, I'd rather have a slightly poor video than have choppy audio. I find choppy audio even more annoying. I uh, migrated back to the uh, 9010 with the GT1030 in it. Um, I can't show you the GT1030 because it's not in here anymore. But we'll get into that with what ended up happening here, which is why I need to replace or fix that other unit. So what ended up happening is this thing fired up. I quickly hooked up the graphics card and found out I could get the 4K60 out of the GT1030. So I went, fantastic. This one's been working fine for years. Everything's good to go. Threw this in and started to watch a couple of movies. Well, what ended up happening is this thing held on valiantly for about three and a half hours. And then it cut loose with the magic smoke. It, uh, I heard a sizzle. Uh, first off, the screen went black. I heard a sizzle from across the room. I got a blinking amber light on the power button, which in the Dell signifies usually a power problem. And the power supply released the magic smoke. It completely burned up. Like, crispy. Uh, there was a bit of fire. And we will take a look at the damages that happened in that power supply. I haven't even opened it yet, so I haven't even seen what the board looks like on that, uh, on that power supply. So, that now leaves me back to... I have zero to run my home theater system. So the ATI card won't work. The GT1030 
will output what I need, but it smoked the PC. Now, I'm not even sure if there was any other residual damages on the PC yet. I don't know if the board's good, the processor's good, the memory's good, and God knows what can happen when a power supply blows up like that. But, um, so what we ended up doing is I took a look around the lab, and we threw this box together. So we have this guy. Uh, this is not the cleanest computer build I've ever done, given that uh, I wanted to go with the small aesthetic because I really did like that micro. It fit in with the, um, the rest of the components of the entertainment center quite well, actually. Um, and it was, and even for being a small form factor Dell, the fans, especially with what I was asking it to stream, like Netflix, Amazon Prime, stuff like that, YouTube, because um, it's always fun to watch some YouTube at 65 inches, um, the fans never really got too loud. Now, this is the graphics card in question, the, the GT1030. I'll get some light on that. This one specifically, because it generates a lot of heat, I went fanless on it. So there is no fan on this graphics card. And that also helps cut the noise down significantly. Uh, my wife runs a RTX 2080 non-TI as her primary graphics card. And when she asked the computer to do some things that are graphics heavy, uh, it sounds like a vacuum cleaner starts up next to her sometimes. So did not want that to happen when I was in the middle of watching a movie. So we tossed this one together, uh, Kraken AIO, because it was actually the only thing that was in stock and they had it fit. Uh, I, never, I ne never pulled that off, whoops. The power supply I had kicking around the lab, this is an 800 watt power supply, so I will not have the power delivery problems that I had before. However, it's not modular, so I had to sh cram a whole bunch of power cord up there <laughs> that was unused. Uh, we've got cooling pipes from the AIO, Hard drive-wise, this has an M.2 drive in it. Obviously, it doesn't need much for storage because it's essentially a front end for an entertainment center. But we have the NVIDIA graphics card there. Now, the plate is not for the NVIDIA graphics card because I had to go from a half-height plate to a full-size plate. However, the DVI and the HDMI were what I needed, and this HDMI port was fast enough to do 4K by 60, also, to my pleasant surprise, once I found the option in the TV to turn on uh, HDR lighting, this card can actually support HDR as well and not get overwhelmed. So, really happy about that. The other thing I'm pretty happy about on this guy is I actually have USB-C and I have plenty of USB ports. Uh, the antennas are hooked up for Bluetooth. The entertainment center is hardwired. There's a network switch there for data so I do not have a bandwidth problem. Uh, but this is here for Bluetooth. Keyboard-wise, if anybody needs a uh, keyboard for a entertainment center style PC, I have found this one is very beneficial. Minimal keyboard, but you do have a touchpad mouse. Um, it is the K400 Plus, and it is also very inexpensive. Um, when I picked that up, I think it was $23. So for a good Logitech keyboard, um, especially for a minimal use computer, um, definitely take a look at the, uh, this style of keyboard from Logitech. Uh, I've been a fan for a number of years. One other thing that really bugged me about a, um, this kind of computer is I've been running a Windows Media Center style computer for, oh, since the Vista days. So I have the computer set up to where it can be used as a remote. There's a USB infrared receiver in the entertainment center, so I have a media center remote control that can control this computer. Now, one of the things that I really liked is you used to have a Logitech Harmony remote control. This is a 900, I think, yeah. Now, this is not an easy remote to set up, but once it's set up, it's fantastic. Um, you actually have to program, there's a USB port right here. You have to program this remote with a laptop. Um, however, once it's set up, one of the things that's absolutely fantastic about it is you set up activities 
and then you asked the remote, or the, you, you essentially told the remote what you wanted to do, watch TV, watch the smart hub on the TV, watch the PC, watch a Blu-ray, and it set up all the inputs in the receiver, did all of that, set the whole thing up. But then the, the other super nice thing that it would do is the remote was smart enough where it would know. Um, so like if you had it set up for a cable box, channel plus and minus would operate the cable box. Volume plus and minus would operate the receiver. So it, it knew where the sound was um, was adjusted from and where like the channel was adjusted from or the menu button. The menu button would work the menu on the uh, satellite box or the cable box and the volume button would work the volume on the receiver. Very nice, very amazing. Uh, I've used it for a number of years. I think I'm on my fifth or sixth. Now nah, maybe it's third. Third battery for it. So it got a lot of use. When we went to do this whole project, I unfortunately found out Logitech is discontinuing their Harmony remote controls. You can't buy them anymore. They decided not to make them. That's unfortunate. Um, because when we had everything set up and tweaked exactly, I had everything driven by that Logitech Harmony remote control. I didn't need to touch any other remote. That was the only remote that I needed, and I could control the whole system unless I needed to do something in the menus, like adjust the EQ for the for the room or something like that. But that's uh, set it up once, and then you're done, and you never have to touch the remote again. Uh, we have an old HP uh, Media Center remote that's now subbing in for the Logitech because eventually the Logitech is going to just quit working. Its battery is already stressed, and the battery door is busted. Um, so it's not long for this world. But I wish I could find a... Uh, similar replacement because that was a solution that actually worked very very well so we got this guy which now has an 800 watt power supply that's hooked up to the media center and he's what's running he's what's running in with the nvidia graphics card we do not have an audio problem Every once in a while, the audio goes kind of goes kind of wonky, but that's usually because the computer didn't come out of sleep correctly. A quick reboot, and it's back to rights. So not too worried about it and have not had many problems since construction of this guy. Uh, what is he? He's a Core i7-something. I think, he's, I think it's a 700, and I think it has 32 gigs of memory in it. So not not a huge amount in the horsepower department. But yeah, this is what we ended up with on the Media Center. So these little mini Dells are actually really nice computers. They got some they got some decent horsepower for the price you'll pay for them. And uh they uh they just make great quasi disposable computers. I'm gonna upgrade this to an SSD drive while I can. This one actually had a two terabyte hard drive in it. We'll save that. Two terabytes is still decently large, but it's actually getting kind of small these days, which is kind of bonkers to say. So I use these in a couple of places around the lab. Uh, this is actually one of the bench computers. I really liked this particular model, the small form factor, not the ultra small form factor, but the small because it has four USBs in the front, and it has another six USBs in the back. Plus, you get a decently powerful computer. This one has, let's see, uh, four by four. So this has 16 gigs of RAM in it. So plenty to drive the workbench or something like that. Doesn't need to be too crazy since all it really does is play music and let me look up data sheets and things like that so yeah let's get an ssd thrown in here ask the lab and it shall deliver if you're trying to modernize some of the older gear popping a flash drive in the units uh, i have found makes a dramatic difference from the old mechanical spinning disc it really wakes up some of this old stuff where the uh, the underlying components are still good and relatively modern, but the uh, spinning mechanical discs are very much showing their age. Moving over to flash is always beneficial. With the right caddy, you can uh, get you can squeeze two flash discs into the space of a three and a half. 
And this time we're only going to put in one because this is going to be a uh, Learn Linux workstation. So 16 gigs of RAM and an i7 is going to be plenty for Linux. Uh, this is a 256 gig hard drive. If the new owner needs a little bit more than that, uh, I told them to let me know, and we'll see what we can do about getting some getting some other stuff thrown together. That's the drive in the caddy. These will be a little bit off, so getting these in is kind of entertaining once or twice, but I don't want to pop this in yet because I have to get the power supply in here, and the power supply is rather large. It takes up this whole area on the PC, so we have spare parts that came in. Now, the other thing, too, is the fact that the power supply caught fire should not be a should not be a ding on Dell because it is most certainly not. Um, I'm actually kind of impressed that it held on as valiantly as it did because the power supplies that ship with these units are 240 watt power supplies and that graphics card wants a 300 watt power supply at the minimum. So it was at, at minimum overdrawing this thing by 60 watts. Um, if not more when it spikes up because even, even though it even though it can do it, 4K by 60 is a pretty heavy lift when it comes to um, horsepower needed to make it work right. So it was pushing that graphics card pretty hard. I'm I'm expecting I'm expecting it was uh, it's pretty close to the limits to that uh, GT 1060. So this pops in like so. And if I can just get it to fall into place, that would be fantastic, except there's plugs in the way. There's always plugs in the way. There we go. Okay, three screws in the back to lock the power supply in place. Come on, find it. There we go. That is way too small a screwdriver. I'm going to gonna blow the heads out of those screws. Don't want to strip anything. If you have to do a whole bunch of these, a 12 volt power screwdriver is not a bad idea. I only have to do one today, so that's not too terrible. Okay, open this up. We have board, we have board, CD drive, hard drives. Uh, oh yeah, that's got to come around front. I forgot. So, supplemental 12 volt power on the board, but this cord has to snake around the front of the case. This one has to go down there. So I'll get that in real quick. These big chunky cables on the front, uh, these big, uh, real stiff cables, those are actually the high-speed USBs. Because it's a high data rate signal, it has to have somewhat of a special cable. That was one thing that I noticed on the new TV, too. There's a extremely high bandwidth cable and connector for the uh, 4K TV. Um, to the point where they even say in the manual, do not bend this cable. Uh, they give you bend radiuses on the cable. They give you other stuff. Do not kink this cable. Do not wire tie this cable. Like, they were pretty serious about don't damage this because it might show up in picture degradation. So, um, I did have a problem with a different computer. Actually, I've shown it on the channel once. The One of the higher end, or the gaming slash everything computer other than CAD and video editing. Um, I had, it's running 4K by 120. And uh, it's got, uh, to make it stop blinking video where the cable was falling out and not, and the uh, video cable was not fast enough to deliver the data for the monitor, even though it was DisplayPort, I had to go to an 8K by 30, 8K by 30 or 8K by 60? It might have been 8K by 60, but I had to go to an 8K cable because even a HDMI cable that said it was rated at 
4K by 120 was still giving me bandwidth problems. Um, and that digitally, that shows up as the picture just going away. Everything would be working fine, and then all of a sudden you get a black screen. Before you troubleshoot too much, make sure stuff's not overheating. Obviously, that's always a plus, because stuff that's overheating is having a bad day. Um, but as soon as the overheating problem has been eliminated, or has been proven not to be the issue and or eliminated, the next thing is look at cable bandwidth if you're if you are looking at uh, extremely high speed signals of which 4k by 4k by 120 is definitely in that area oh, come on black wire get off of that post this does not want to lock in there we go there And now we get the fan shroud in. It pops in just like this. So the power supply sucks cold air in from outside. And that gets us all hooked back up. So let's throw the cover back on. And then let's at least see if the computer wakes up and does not give us the magic smoke. I've had enough magic smoke out of this thing for today. Okay, here we go. That fan sounds pretty awful. But it is starting. I'm still getting a little warning light. Let's see if we get picture. Here's my test monitor for PCs that sits down by the left-hand side of the bench. And as you can see, we have a display. So it's, it's yelling at me because of uh, BIOS, which is normal since the board didn't have power. But what I want to do is I want to F5 this at the moment and I want to run this through its extended diagnostics. And I want to beat on this for a while and just make sure we don't have any residual CPU, RAM, or any kind of that damage before I send this off to the next technician. Okay, so we're in diag mode. We're just gonna let this run, and then I'm gonna hit thorough tests and let it run some more. This will take three or four-ish hours, and uh, it's really gonna beat on the um, memory and the CPU specifically during this test. Uh, don't worry about this line. This line is actually on the digital s digital inputs of this particular monitor. Uh, this only shows up when I use the DisplayPort or HDMI connections. If I'm on VGA, VGA or DVI, it doesn't show up. So I have some dead bits in my uh, HDMI chips on this, or I should say digital chips on this particular monitor. But this is a test monitor, so uh, I keep this particular monitor around because it has literally every video input that I could need on it. Uh, VGA, DVI, HDMI, uh, DisplayPort. It's even got composite component Nest Video on it, which is rare for a computer monitor. So, um, but it tucks. So you guys, bench is there. You guys are looking down to the left. This guy just sits on an arm out of the way, and I use it as needed. So we'll let this crank, and I'll let you know what happens when I come back. Okay, after uh, letting it run for a while, we are greeted with a white light, which is good in the Dell world, as that says the board is happy and doesn't have a problem. And that is also confirmed by the wonderful message of all tests have passed. So we've got a repaired computer ready to go for another technician for a Linux box. Let's take a look at that power supply and see what kind of damage we have in there. I want to open that up. I should also note the CPU quieted way down. The fan's not nearly as growly anymore, so it was probably just needing to work the bearing back in and uh, get that all said and done. But if it's still noisy after it runs for a while, we can swap out. Uh, well, we can service the bearing a little bit, or we can uh, swap out the squirrel cage fan. Now, let's talk Dell power supplies. So these things are very complicated for what they are. Um, and they actually do have some communication with the motherboard because even if you have the correct volts and everything like that, Dell does use standard pinouts and not a standard voltages. 
on their supplies. This is a normal connector, uh, power supply testers and stuff will work with those. However, if I take a Corsair power supply and say plug it into a Dell server uh, in an emergency situation where the power supply is blown up on a Friday night and Dell's not open until Monday for me to order parts, uh, it doesn't work. Uh, it doesn't burn anything up because as soon as you get the Dell supply, everything will fire back up. But So the power supply talks to the motherboard uh, either probably I squared C or Skippy but some form of bus where it actually has some communication to the board and it will not wake up a, um, some Dells, especially servers and things like that, will not wake up a generic power supply. They just won't do it. So, ooh, actually, compared to some of the other ones I've opened, this one's pretty simple and straightforward switching supply. So, there's a decent amount going on here, but, uh, so we have input, input filter, um, where's my rectifier, got some control circuitry, the main switchers are here, I think, this is probably the main switching transformer, this is a rectifier. For the other supplies would be my guess. Main DC rectifier might be here. We have two high-frequency transformers. These are just chokes. There's bulk DC caps. Cap down there. So, yeah, this is actually from a Dell supply. I was surprised. This is this straightforward. Here's one of our bridge rectifiers. That's on the output side, though, not the input. This has been off for a while, too. Uh, switching power supplies can sometimes hold voltage in the bulk caps, things like that. So um, definitely take care when dismantling one of these and take extreme care when dismantling one of these when they are plugged in due to the fact that some of these heat sinks, at least uh, in some of the supplies I've run into, have been on the hot side. And I have gotten blasted off of those heat sinks before. I'll tell you what, that does not feel good. All right, we're gonna need to cut some cables and then we'll be able to lift out. But I want some carnage. With as much noise as this made, this thing burned up. Actually, I may have been backwards. The, yeah, I may have been backwards. I think I was backwards actually in the topology because my, yeah, my 110 line enters here and the power supply goes, where's the isolation slots? Here's some of the isolation here. So it looks like main switching and then it goes over into regulation. I do not plan on repairing this, so we will just clip a couple of those. Well, I don't see any expanded capacitors, which I was kind of expecting to see. Caps got too hot and maybe let go. These are just coils. Those are cut lines. I'm expecting some burn marks. Oh, there it is. There it is. Interesting. That's a weird fault. I would not have guessed that. I don't know how well this is going to show up on camera, and I have a flashlight for additional light. But right here, this ceramic capacitor is cracked in half and burnt open. So... Here's where some of our damage was. I have I uh, so this this cap is definitely toast, and we have some burn marks over there on the board. I don't know if there's more damage than that, but uh, we do have a bit of parts carnage. But surprisingly, that's actually all I'm seeing. And there's two caps there that are dead: uh, C6 and C10. 
So, surprisingly, that's actually all I'm seeing. I expected more out of that. But, uh, yeah, so in terms of Dell power supplies that I've run into and taken apart before, this guy's pretty simple. We do have a little bit of crispy components. Um, I will check the uh, high current stuff, the big silicon, and uh, possibly these coils and stuff like that. Take them off, harvest them off this board, because the, those can be some valuable parts, especially like the switching FET right here. That's probably the main switching FET for the uh, transformer. Big power guy, lots of heat sinking. Yeah, some of these opto isolators. This is this is the isol. Yeah, there's the isolation bridge, the isolation slot, and then these opto isolators are the feedback for the control. So, yeah, very cool. Okay, so I got a couple of parts to harvest off of there. Here is some capacitor goodness that has fallen out on my table. So we actually roasted up some ceramic capacitors. Not the fault I was expecting. But anyway, thanks for swinging by the lab. And I will see everybody in the next video. So as always, more is always on the way.